And hopefully you can all see that now. Um, I can't see you anymore because my screens have been taken up elsewhere, but I, I'll uh, assume that you can see and hear everything I'm saying. Um, so I just wanted to start off by kind of asking the question, is noise a problem? Um, and what I've gone and done here is I've basically gone to the World Health Organization. I've looked at their most recent report and I wanted to kind of pick out some of the kind of most hard hitting stats from this report. So one of them um, estimates that 17% of adults aged 20 to 69 have suffered some degree of noise induced hearing loss. And I think the big stat, which is really quite terrifying, is that they're estimating that over 1.1 billion young adults are at risk of permanent um, noise induced hearing loss from mostly kind of recreational or leisure based activities such as personal listening devices, going to concerts, going to nightclubs, that sort of thing. But it's not just our, our recreational noise that's a problem here. It's also um, occupational noise. So despite kind of most countries nowadays having some sort of um, legislation in place to, to prevent noise induced hearing loss. So, for example, here in the UK, we have the control of noise at work regulations, which came into effect in 2005, uh, also applies to the music industry from 2008. We still get reports of um, occupational noise induced hearing loss in, in certain industries. So, for example, in our construction industry, it's estimated that around 25 percent of workers have some degree of noise induced hearing loss. In agriculture, it's a quite a scary number. It's estimated between 65 and 67 percent. I guess what, what we're interested in today is, is in the music industry, and, and that's been estimated to be somewhere between 37 and 58 percent, depending on which paper you go at and uh, go to and, and how they've defined um, hearing loss in that case. But yes, the, the answer to the question is it does seem that noise is still a problem um, in today's society. So looking at hearing loss in musicians more specifically, this is kind of getting a lot more hype in the media recently over the last couple of years. So these I think all these news articles are from the last couple of years. Um, I think the one Dave Grohl is the most recent one. So he uh, he's saying that he's he's now got noise induced hearing loss um, from performing with the Foo Fighters. Um, you'll notice most of these are kind of pop and rock artists, but the one in the bottom left corner there is from uh, the Royal Opera House. So a viola player, he uh, lost his hearing during a, a rehearsal of the Flight of the Valkyries um, and he took out a legal case against the uh, Royal Opera House. He actually won that in the end. Um, so that is, uh, yeah, that news article there is a little bit out of text. He did win that in the end. But it just seems that it's becoming um, a lot more kind of well known in the media. And of course, there was a film, uh, I think it was a couple of years ago now, The Sound of Metal, which was about a drummer that, that loses his hearing. And I think that really brought this in, into the into the uh, general public's focus. But what, what do I mean when I'm talking about hearing loss in this case? Well, here we've got a picture of our, our audiogram that um, we all know and love, but we do love to give it a good bashing as well. And, and for pretty good reason, actually, um, this is our gold standard hearing test, but it, it only really tells us a small amount of the picture that could be going on with, with someone's hearing and any problems they might be having. So first of all, the audiogram only goes up to or normally only goes up to eight kilohertz. But we know that human hearing can extend way beyond this, up to 16,000 or 20,000 um, hertz. Um, we know this information could be useful for uh, speech processing, speech and noise processing, uh, sound localization, probably for listening to music as well. So why aren't we measuring at these extended high frequencies? Another thing as well is that we tend to measure it at kind of set octaves, so one, two, four, eight kilohertz. Um, but we're kind of missing quite a lot of information in between there. So when we look at musicians hearing uh, and we look at these kind of intermediate um, frequencies, so 3000, 6000 hertz, it's not uncommon to see musicians with these what we call noise notches in their audiogram, which could suggest some sort of degree of um, hearing loss. And the other thing as well is we've got this normal hearing range that goes all the way from uh, minus 10 up to, to 20 um, decibels. So it's, it's quite a wide range of variability. So, you know, you could have someone whose hearing is around about 20, but you wouldn't necessarily say it's the same as someone who has hearing that's at minus 10. 
So, you know, th there's a lot that could be going on within this normal hearing range. And the other thing as well, when we're looking at our audiogram, we're mostly focusing on, um, well, traditionally, it's, it's thought to relate to um, outer hair cell function within the cochlea. Uh, and noise damage is traditionally associated with damage to the, the outer hair cells. But more recently, there's been some attention to um, how the inner hair cells, and more specifically, the auditory nerve fibres that attach to the inner hair cells can be affected. So um, this is a term called cochlear synaptopathy, or you may be familiar with the term hidden hearing loss. So what we're looking at here is a, is a picture of a, an inner hair cell connected to the auditory nerve fiber. And this is a nice, healthy inner hair cell. And then following noise exposure, we get synaptopathy. So this is a disconnect between the auditory nerve fibers and the inner hair cells. And then over time, these disconnected nerve fibers can uh, degenerate so what does this mean for hearing though? Well, the particular auditory nerve fibres that are affected are these what we call low spontaneous rate or high threshold auditory nerve fibres, which encode information for moderate to high sound levels. Whereas the nerve fibres which are more kind of important for detecting very, very quiet sounds, these tend to be um, less affected by, by noise exposure. So what this means is that someone could come in with cochlear synaptopathy into an audiology clinic and they can do the pure tone audiogram and they have completely normal hearing. They're able to detect very, very quiet sounds in a silent soundproof booth. Whereas <clears throat> when they go to a, a party or go to a pub or they're going to any kind of other slightly noisier situation, they may then struggle to kind of follow a conversation within that noisy environment which isn't that uncommon. Quite often people do come to audiology clinics and one of their number one complaints is I'm struggling to hear in a, in a noisy environment. But then actually when you test their hearing, their, their pure tone audiogram is, uh, is normal or saying it's normal. And hence the term hidden hearing loss. Their, their, their hearing problems are hidden behind the audiogram. So how do we go about detecting uh, cochlear synaptopathy in humans? Well, we can do this in animals as well, but we, we've been doing this in humans as well. Um, we can do the auditory brainstem response, which is basically EEG. Um, what we can do is look at how the electrical signal is being sent from the auditory nerve up to the, the um, up into the auditory brainstem, up to the inferior colliculus within the brainstem. And what we get are these kind of telltale waves. Hopefully I can point this out. So one of the most important ones that we're interested in is this one here. So this is our wave one. So this corresponds to um, auditory nerve firing. So if you've got cochlear synaptopathy, you would expect a reduction in the amplitude of this wave one, or perhaps uh, an increased latency in this wave one. So it might be pushed back, it occurs later on. Another one that we're interested in is wave five, which is this one over here. And we use this one um, kind of as a, as a threshold measure. We use this one uh, in newborn hearing screening to see if uh, baby's hearing is okay. And this is kind of our, our big telltale wave that they are receiving an auditory signal or not. And what we can do is look at the ratio between wave one and wave five uh, to kind of normalize that measure uh, for every individual essentially. Um, so for example, males tend to have thicker skulls and bigger head sizes and therefore they have um we, we can't measure the response as well so it'd look like they have a smaller wave one compared to females but if we normalize it to wave five then we can kind of account for those sorts of uh, individual differences so what do we know so far about cochlear synaptopathy well there's been quite a few studies done in animals and so mice guinea pigs that sort of thing um and these studies are obviously very well controlled. So they tend to expose the animal to a set sound limit uh, for a, a very set period of time. And they can induce cochlear synaptopathy in these animals. And then they can go and sacrifice the animals and physically count how many synapses are still there. Um, obviously, we, we can't do that in humans. Um, so we rely on these proxy measures of cochlear synaptopathy instead. So for example, our, our auditory brainstem response or we look at their speech and noise processing abilities, that sort of thing. Um, but the, the research in humans is <clears throat> not so clear cut. 
Um, so there are some studies that seem to suggest, yes, uh, there is this effect of noise exposure on cochlear synaptopathy in humans. If you come visit us in Manchester, or if you've ever followed any of our, um, our papers, we tend to not find uh, any kind of relationship between these proxy measures, cochlear synaptopathy and noise exposure. But the trouble is with most of these previous studies is that they tend to be um, cross-sectional studies. So we can only really get a snapshot of how a person's hearing is in relation to um, their, their um, noise exposure. So it's important that we try and look a little bit more longitudinally at the relationship between hearing function and noise exposure. And that's exactly what I want to talk to you about for the rest of the talk today. So we had a project running in Manchester called Time to Face Music, addressing hearing health in future professional musicians. And there was two main goals to this project. The first one was a longitudinal assessment of the effects of noise exposure on hearing health in musicians and non-musicians. This is including proxy measures of cochlear synaptopathy. And the second part of this project was um, looking at reasons why musicians do or do not use hearing protection and using this uh, behavior change wheel, which is a, a framework of um, behavior change to um, develop interventions to try and promote the use of hearing protection amongst musicians. Now, I'm, I'm just going to focus on the first part today. I don't have time for, to go through both parts of this project. But if anyone's interested, we've recently had the paper published on the second part of this project. And I gave a talk uh, probably about a year ago at the Oral Diversity Network, which is available online. So if anybody wants to go back and watch that afterwards, um, I, can, I can send you the link to that. So the design of our longitudinal study, um, we call it a longitudinal. It, it's more kind of a shortitudinal. We, we've only really measured um, hearing over, over two years, but that's longer than other uh, groups have, have assessed, especially for these proxy measures of cochlear synaptopathy. So we measured at three time points, so baseline, T1, which was 12 months after, and T2, which was another 12 months after that. Um, you'll notice that T2 uh, kind of ended a bit abruptly in March 2020, and I think you know why that is. Um, but it did mean that we were kind of slightly lower on the numbers of participants that came through. However, um, as long as our participants showed up for just at least one of these follow-ups, um, we were able to include them in the, in the longitudinal assessment. So we actually ended up with 64 musicians and 30 non-musicians involved in this study. Our musicians are from the, mostly from the Royal Northern College of Music, uh, mostly students, so they're all quite young, early career musicians. So what do we do? Well, at each of these time points, T0, T1 and T2, we did a very, very comprehensive um, test battery with them. So, for example, we looked at um, pure tone audiometric thresholds. We looked at extended high frequency thresholds, so up to 16 kilohertz. We conducted distortion product autoacoustic emissions to look at outer hair cell function and the, uh, the integrity of the outer hair cells. Um, we did our electrophysiological measure, so the auditory brainstem response. Um, we had a speech and noise test, so we used something called the coordinate response measure, which involves listening to a target speaker and trying to ignore two distracting speakers. Um, and you've got to try and follow this instruction that's given to you by your target speaker whilst trying not to be distracted by these two other speakers. And then you, you click a, a color and a number on a screen corresponding to whatever the target speaker has said to you. And the, the distracting speakers, speakers can either be presented as um, centrally with the target speaker or they can be spatially offset. So they're 60 degrees either side of the target speaker. And it gets much, much easier when you spatially offset these uh, distracting speakers. Uh, to measure noise exposure, we used um, something called the NESI, Noise Exposure Structured Interview. Uh, this is developed in-house in Manchester by uh, our colleagues, um, Hannah Guest. Um, if you can tell, Hannah Guest is from Scotland, hence the name uh, Nessie, which we all think is great. Um, it's a really um, in-depth interview. It really taps into um, people's recreational, occupational uh, noise exposures across their entire life. And we get them to focus on particular discrete periods of their life where they may have been uh, for example, going out clubbing more often or going to concerts more, whatever that may be. 
um, and it uses um, vocal efforts to try and estimate uh, noise levels in particular noisy situations. Um, and then we also had some self-report measures as well. So we looked at um, self-reported tinnitus, hyperacusis, and self-reported hearing and noise difficulties as well. So as you can see, a very, very comprehensive test battery at each of these time points. So looking at some of our results, um, what I'm presenting first of all here is the, um, <clears throat> the results of the noise exposure interview. So we can get a kind of a, a noise a lifetime noise exposure measure, essentially. Uh, and if we look at, first of all, on the left hand side, so over here, the blue are, are musicians and our, our red are, are non musicians. We can see that musicians had more occupational noise exposure or reported more occupational noise exposure than our non musicians do down here. When it comes to recreational noise, there's no difference between our musicians and non musicians. In fact, maybe our non musicians are ever so slightly higher, but not, not much, not significantly so. And then you'll notice we've got total noise exposure over here on the right. Now, this is a combination of recreational and occupational. And you'll notice that recreational and total noise exposure look very, very similar. And that's because this is being measured on a, on a log scale, you'll notice here. So what this is telling us is that pretty much all of the musicians and non-musicians' -musician, noise exposure is coming from their recreational activities. And actually the occupational is not really, um, it's not uh, contributing quite as much to the total noise exposure. And what we've done here based on people's total noise exposure as well is divide our participants into a low and high noise exposure group. So anyone who had less than one uh, log unit of noise exposure was in the low noise exposure group and anyone with more than one we put in this high noise exposure group. So this is just at T0. So this is basically some cross-sectional findings just to start with. Um, looking at the auditory brainstem response, first of all we're looking at uh, wave one over here. We don't see any differences between our musicians and non-musicians and no difference between low and high noise exposure groups. So this is wave one, so corresponding to the, the um, auditory nerve firing, the amplitude of that, of that wave. We're looking at wave five over here. So this is the one that we use for measuring our thresholds. Again, we don't see any differences between musicians and non-musicians, nor between low and high noise exposure groups. And then we're looking at wave one, which is how we, uh, wave one to five ratio, sorry, for, for normalizing uh, that measure. And getting rid of these individual differences and we don't see any differences between low and high noise exposure groups however we do see a significantly greater wave one to five ratio for musicians as composed as compared to uh, non-musicians down here now um, this isn't due to noise exposure if if it was due to noise exposure you would expect the wave one to five ratio to actually be lower so it, we're not entirely sure why musicians have this higher wave one to five ratio. We think it might be because um, they've got slightly higher wave one in our musicians compared to our non-musicians, not significantly so. And they've actually got a slightly lower wave five uh, compared to the, the non-musicians. Again, not significantly so, but when you combine these two measures, you get this uh, significantly greater ratio over here. Um, looking at our, our um, speech and noise measure, going down on this axis, uh, on the y-axis, is um, an increase in performance. Um, and you can see that there's no difference between our musicians and non-musicians. There's no significant differences between our low and high noise exposure groups. The only differences we're seeing here is that people are performing better in the spatially offset condition, uh, as opposed to when um, the distracting speakers are, are presented centrally. And again, this is just at time point zero, just for, for the time, time being. So we were looking at um, noise exposure and musicianship um, as categorical variables there, there. So what we wanted to then do is look at them um, as some continuous variables. So rather than low and high noise exposure groups, looking at total noise exposure on a, on a continuous scale. And we did find a couple of slightly interesting findings. So uh, wave five latency, so the, the kind of time delay in wave five appearing in our auditory brainstem response is delayed more 
for those who had uh, higher levels of total noise exposure, but that was just for males. Now, it's not entirely clear why this is. Um, it doesn't seem to be related to cochlear synaptopathy, or it doesn't seem to be a measure of cochlear synaptopathy, but it may be kind of indicative of a kind of a slower propagation of this electrical signal up the auditory brainstem in males who have higher levels of noise exposure. And the other thing we saw was that for those with higher levels of noise exposure, there was a reduction in their distortion products otoacoustic emissions level. So uh, our measure of outer hair cell function. So those who had higher levels of noise exposure had poorer outer hair cell function. This is just a baseline. So now we're going to look at some of the longitudinal findings. Um, so what we're looking at here is our total lifetime noise exposure. And we've got T1, uh, T0, baseline, T1 and T2. So these are 12 months and, and 24 months after the baseline. Um, and I, I'm, I'm going to go back to something that uh, Neil said in his talk. So he said, once rock and roll, always rock and roll. I wrote it down because I thought that was brilliant. Basically, what we can see here is um, people who were classified as having high levels of noise exposure at T0 continue to show higher levels or report higher levels of noise exposure um, at uh, subsequent testing sessions compared to the people who are in the low noise exposure group. So essentially, uh, the people in the high noise exposure group have got a steeper rate of growth in terms of their noise exposure compared to these guys down here in the low noise exposure group. But interestingly, again, no differences between our musicians and non-musicians in terms of the amount of noise that they're reporting. Um, looking at some of the findings of the um, longitudinal study, again, very in keeping with our, uh, our typical kind of Manchester findings, they, they tend to be quite null. Um, what we've actually found here is an improvement in quite a few of our, our measures over the course of this longitudinal study. So again, we're looking at the um, coordinate resp response measure here. So this is our speech and noise task. Um, going down on this uh, y-axis here is an improvement. So you can see that for both musicians and non-musicians and those in low and high noise exposure groups, we are um, seeing a significant improvement across the three time points. And we saw something similar as well for our auditory brainstem response. Uh, and we also saw something similar for our pure tone audiogram. So on this scale, going up on the y-axis is an improvement in performance. And you can see for kind of our average low frequency audiometry, um, an improvement for musicians and non-musicians, no effect of noise exposure. Similar sort of thing going on here for the, the high frequency uh, threshold, so up to eight kilohertz. And then when we look at the extended high frequency, we can actually see a, an increase in thresholds, a significant increase in thresholds across the three time points. So this suggests a worsening as we uh, were going across the study. However, this was not related to noise exposure. So it's not clear exactly why we're seeing this year on year decrease, uh, sorry, increase in uh, extended high frequency thresholds. Perhaps it's kind of an age related effect and you see maybe a one or two decibel drop um, every year. I'm not sure. So looking at the self report measures now, the majority of participants reported no change in their experience of tinnitus or hyperacusis or their hearing and noise ability. So, for example, if they're experiencing it more or less often or whether their symptoms have got better or worse or that sort of thing. And most people reported no change across the study. And you can see that here with these two pie charts. So the one on the left is looking at people's um, experience of tinnitus from uh, baseline to the first follow up. And then this second pie chart here is looking from the, the, fir sorry, the first follow up to the second follow up. And you can see that for most participants, they report no change in their experience of tinnitus. However, if we do kind of dig a little bit deeper and we look at these people here who did report a change. Um, we asked them, have they had an improvement or a worsening of their symptoms? And actually, for most of these guys here, they reported an improvement in their uh, their tinnitus symptoms. So 60 percent uh, noticed an improvement from T0 to T1 and it's 58. So similar amount from T1 to T2. 
And again, we wanted to dig a little bit deeper. So we said, OK, why have you noticed an improvement in your symptoms? And I think this is quite interesting that for um, these guys here who noticed an improvement, about three quarters um, attributed this to either reducing the amount of noise exposure that they had in the year previous or uh, by increasing their use of hearing protection devices, so using earplugs more regularly. So it seems to me that there's perhaps for these participants who have noticed an improvement, um, that may be due to increasing their hearing conservation measures. But yeah, who knows? <laughs> Self-report, it's not quite as uh, clear cut. Oh, I seem to have frozen. There we go. Um, so a couple more uh, exploratory analyses that we did based on the longitudinal data. Um, we haven't really seen any kind of longitudinal effects of uh, noise exposure on hearing measures, but we wanted to see if um, the results that we found at, at T0, so at the baseline, were uh, repeatable at each of the, the subsequent time points. So what we're looking at here are um, outer hair cell function as measured by outer um, distortion product otoacoustic emissions and its relationship to uh, total lifetime noise exposure and at every single time point so essentially three cross-sectional studies we're seeing this significant relationship between noise exposure and outer hair cell function so more noise exposure poorer outer hair cell function and then finally, we wanted to look at the test retest reliability to make sure that our measures had been consistent, I suppose, across um, each of the time points. And on the whole, um, the intraclass correlation coefficients would indicate that we've got pretty good to, in some cases, excellent um, test retest reliability. You'll notice that for a few of our measures down here, so uh, the speech and noise measure and some of our um, ABR measures, uh, brainstem response measures, is kind of fair or poor intraclass correlation coefficients from baseline to time point uh, one to the first follow up. What I think this is reflecting, especially for the speech and noise task, is um, a practice effect. So from T0 to T1, we see an improvement in, in people's performance on this, but that isn't quite as marked from T1 to T2. And the ABRs, um, again, it's a little bit trickier to explain, but I, I think it might have something to do with at time point zero, so at the baseline, participants may have been a little bit more apprehensive about the procedure, uh, and maybe kind of not quite as rested, and we didn't get quite as good measure as we did at the subsequent um, testing sessions that we did. So I think we got an improvement in, in how well we recorded that as the study went on. Um, right, so... That's me nearly done. Um, I think to conclude, in very typical Manchester fashion, we, we found little to no evidence of noise-induced cochlear in musicians or non-musicians, for that matter. Um, and we don't really see any longitudinal changes uh, or nothing really drastically changing over the course of this two-year period. Um, and the changes that we do see are either an improvement or may not be related to noise exposure. So I guess the question then is noise exposure not a problem based on this study? Well, I would say absolutely not, or we shouldn't really jump to that sort of conclusion um, for numerous different reasons. The first one being that we have seen these effects of noise exposure on certain measures of hearing function, um, for example, our, our outer hair cell function, um, and that was consistently found at all three time points. Granted, it's not a longitudinal finding, but it does seem to suggest there's something going on there. Um, another interesting thing from this study, the longitudinal study, is that we're seeing these positive effects of um, hearing conservation measures on people's experiences of tinnitus. So it does seem to suggest that they were suffering from noise-induced problems and maybe less so as, as they're going uh, through life and starting to take care of their hearing a little bit more. I guess the main limitation of this study is it was only two years long. There's only three time points. So um, I call it a shortitudinal rather than uh, a longitudinal study. Um, I think this is still, as, a, as far as I'm aware, the only longitudinal study to look at um, measures of cochlear synaptopathy. Um, so, you know, it, it's still it's still an interesting uh, length of time to be studying people for. But ideally, we would have been like like to have um, captured, you know, maybe 
five, ten years, um, and maybe from an earlier age as well. So from when these musicians first picked up their instruments. And then we may have been able to kind of detect the point at which uh, the outer hair cells had started to change in relation to, to noise exposure. Um, I suppose the final point is that absence of evidence is not the same as evidence of absence. And that's something that we do like to say quite commonly uh, from, from uh, our lab in Manchester. And basically it's just saying that um, just because we haven't captured it with our measures, which may, be, may not be sensitive enough, doesn't mean that there's not noise-induced damage um, taking place. It just means that we haven't we haven't captured it. So anyway, um, that's me. Um, thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate you sticking around um, to listen to my talk. Thank you to my uh, collaborators as well on this project. You'll notice Chris Plack's names on there. Um, so if you do want to ask any questions, you can go and grill him as well afterwards. Um, and thank you to to the funders of this project as well. Uh, and thank you all for listening.